Yeah. There's Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Bruce, how you doing, Big Cat? Okay. Yeah, there he is. All right. Bruce, I owe you an email. <laughs> That's Kathy Garnett, but she's not visible. Kathy has got a light in her. Kathy, eye. where are you? We can't see you. You're shining your camera on the light in the ceiling. He's in the light. Yes. <laughs> oh, I, oh, golly. She's standing in the light. Yep. She's halfway to being raptured, is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, are you there, Kathy? Kathy, go oh, maybe she's gone off for a moment. All right. Um, I think we should get started. Um, okay. Oh, uh, nine thirty. So this is the nine thirty hour. So sorry. God, wait. And we're recording, everybody. Oh my God! All right. Okay. All right. So good morning, people. Uh, I'm so happy to see all of you here. I'm I'm thrilled. This is wonderful. Um, so you probably know me. I'm Hillary Hopkins, and um, Dave Dyer there um, is going to be our co-host. Um, Dave, um, I did not know this, but Dave not only is a historian, but he's also on the board of directors of the Congregational Library and Archives in Boston, which if you did not know, was founded in 1843, 1843, and is the repository of um, all things having to do with our faith. Um, so this is a four part series, uh, which has been prepared by scholars at the library on the occasion of the 400th anniversary of the landing of the pilgrims at Plymouth December, just picture it, December 1620. Yeah. Um, we have some goals for this, um, for this series. Um, the first one is that um, we want to see how where we have been in the past may inform and illuminate where we are now to draw not only lessons from the pilgrims' issues and behavior, but also ideas about our own actions uh, today. And secondly, I think um, maybe to obtain a somewhat more nuanced understanding of what we might mean by the other, which we talk about a lot. Um, I think that's an important thing, just how other uh, is the other. So I said there are four parts to this. Uh, the first one today is called They Were One Body in Christ. Uh, on October 4th, we skip a Sunday. On October 4th, they were people of the book. On October 11th, they were colonists. They were colonizers. And the last one on the 18th of October is they were congregationalists, pretty much just like us. Now, uh, for each part, uh, Dave will fill you in on some of the history, uh, some of which you may know or you may think you know, and some you may not know. Uh, then we will pose a couple of questions uh, for you to discuss in breakout groups for about 20 minutes. And when we return, uh, we'll discuss what you found. Um, <clears throat> now, I am inexperienced. That means I know nothing about doing breakout groups. Lexi gave me a tutorial, but we will manage it, right? Because we're all go with the flow loosey-goosey. Um, I just want to end this little introduction by <clears throat> reading you a part of the introduction from this curriculum. <clears throat> it says, in what follows, we will examine the decisions the New World's first migrating pilgrims faced, and insofar as they are knowable, the beliefs these men and women held. We will do so first to commemorate their accomplishment, but we will also question their actions, both within their historical moment and our own. Committed to the truth as they were, <clears throat> our Puritan forebears would expect no less of us. So, Dave, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Hillary, and um, hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, you know, the pilgrim story is one that's very familiar to us. It, it's um, at least in, in outline and in details that uh, may or may not be true. Uh, every fall, of course, at Thanksgiving, we reenact what um, we think was um, a 
uh, feast of, uh, to celebrate good relations between the pilgrim colonists who had landed in Plymouth uh, and the, uh, the Native Americans who'd been there for 12,000 years. Um, we also have a lot of misconceptions about um, the, the, um, the pilgrims. And I'm going to call them pilgrims and Puritans interchangeably because um, they neither term um, was familiar to them, although if they had embraced one, they would have embraced Puritan. Uh, they were later called pilgrims. Um, the, uh, besides the familiar story of Thanksgiving, some of you may be familiar with, um, there's a poem by Longfellow uh, that isn't probably read much in high schools these days, but I had to read it in high school called The Courtship of Miles Standish, uh, which um, talks about a love triangle in the Plymouth, in the, in the Plymouth colony between uh, Miles Standish, who was not a member of the congregation, and uh, uh, a young woman, the only single woman on the voyage, um, Priscilla Mullins, and uh, another uh, single man who was a member of the church named John Alden. Uh, encourage you, you know, to read that sometime if you if you haven't. Um, but it, it, it's another of the sources of mythology about about the pilgrims. Uh, another uh, familiar story that um, many of us learned uh, early on was about the Maypole of Marymount, where the the pilgrims, um, a group of um, fun seekers uh, and dissatisfied church members left the Plymouth congregation to establish their own community at Marymount uh, and uh, set up a maypole and uh, drank beer and danced and celebrated and, and uh, were condemned by the, by the Plymouth pilgrims. Um, it, it feeds into the myth that the pilgrims and the Puritans were killjoys, uh, that they didn't, um, you know, as H.L. Mencken once famously wrote, um, a definition of Puritanism was um, the uh, harrowing uh, idea that somewhere, somewhere, someplace, somebody might be having fun. Uh, and, uh, you know, but, but in contrast, the, uh, the pilgrims were and Puritans were uh, far from that. I mean, they, they uh, drank, they consumed alcohol, they uh, had affairs. They, you know, they were human beings just like the rest of us. Uh, they didn't uh, embrace all of those behaviors, but they uh, certainly recognized them. Um, I, I think another myth, myth that's come up, or a point of view about a perspective on the, on the Puritans that has come up in, in more recent decades is the notion that they were the, the tip of the spear for English colonial imperialism that came um, and uh, without any sense of right, uh, uh, took over native lands, uh, evicted uh, uh, the Native Americans. Uh, there, there is a complicated story there uh, and that we'll look at in part three of this series, but um, is um, many caricatures, that one is, is uh, a, a bit overwrought and e extreme. And we'll look at it in, in more detail, as I say, in, in, in session three of this, of this series. Um, the final myth, I think, that is, um, surrounds these, this group of, of settlers was the, the notion that they were the first Democrats. Uh, some, uh, often they're celebrated for the Mayflower Compact, which was an agreement between the um, church people on board the Mayflower and the secular people on, on board the Mayflower to set up a civil organization um, and to have um, the uh, government um, established by the consent of the governed. Um, it was a practical thing. It wasn't a theoretical thing that, um, and, and I, I doubt that any of the people on board the Mayflower understood the long-term significance of, the, of that idea. But nonetheless, uh, the pilgrims slash Puritans were, uh, played an important role in establishing uh, the way the English colonists developed and uh, the way that the United States emerged out of uh, its English colonial origins. 
So uh, let's uh, talk about who they, who they were. Um, on board the Mayflower, there were 102 passengers, uh, about 60% of whom were church members, uh, and 40% were crew people, um, trades people that were going to be important to the uh, establishment of the new colony, and military people who were there to provide security. Um, of the church people, uh, most had come from um, an area north of Cambridge in England, um, and were uh, traced their roots to uh, a, a um, what was called a conventicle, a group of um, uh, religious reformers dissatisfied with uh, the st state of religion and particularly the church in England uh, in uh, the 16th century, and then wanted to uh, provide an alternative to that. And they had very simple beliefs. They were highly literate, well-educated, uh, and avid readers of the Bible. And we'll see that in the next session in a couple of weeks. Um, but they looked at the Bible texts, which were newly available in English. Uh, and then they looked at the state of the church, which had grown up for more than 1,500 years since um, the uh, life of Jesus. Uh, and saw a big disconnect. They saw, looking at the church, many outward trappings that were dissatisfactory uh, to them. Uh, stained glass windows, vestments, uh, bishops. Uh, it, this was a group of people who uh, looked to the Bible for guidance and questioned authority when they found it um, in contradiction to what they were reading in, in the Bible. It was a small group, a splinter group. Um, there was a mainline Puritan movement in uh, England that, uh, uh, whose descendants settled Boston in the decade after the, the pilgrims arrived in Plymouth. Um, but the, the group that um, established the Plymouth colony were uh, increasingly uh, disinclined to engage with the formal religious establishment. Um, they later became known as separatists in that they would secede from the, the church and form their own church. Uh, and critical to this idea was the notion of a covenant, that they, uh, they drew their from uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, which I'm going to paraphrase right now, which is that um, Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. Uh, the, the notion that two or three believing Christians uh, could establish a meaningful organization or could be part of a meaningful community uh, that with Christ in their midst. Um, the idea of that spread into uh, a covenant of calling people together or joining people together who thought the same way, who believed the same things, who wanted to explore um, the meaning of faith in, in the same way. Uh, it was not a popular idea in England, uh, and increasingly, uh, particularly after the accession of James the, the I in 1603, who was a more controlling authoritarian monarch than his predecessors, immediate predecessor had been. Um, times were tough. Um, for people who believed the things that the, the Puritans believed. Uh, their ministers were uh, ejected from their parishes, um, they were often banished, they were jailed, they were fined. Um, they were not allowed to hold conventicles, which is what they um, had wanted to do and had been in the habit of doing. So in 1608, the um, group, there was a group in that area north of Cambridge uh, called a little town called Scrooby, um, decided to leave England. So they gathered together um, and moved on to the Netherlands, which was more hospitable to uh, reform Christianity, and set up uh, uh, a church first in Amsterdam and then subsequently in Leiden. Well, what happened by uh, the late 16 teens is that, that after about a decade there, um, they felt marginalized in the answer in, in the, uh, Dutch society. Um, their children were learning Dutch and becoming Dutch. Uh, they desperately wanted to go back to England. 
Um, and th they were looking for alternatives. And the alternative um, th that came to them was um, a, a group of um, entrepreneurs and business people uh, had established something called the Virginia Company, which was to um, develop the, North, the English North American uh, continent that was claimed, part of that that was claimed by the, by the Royal Crown. So the uh, Pilgrims got in touch with, with the uh, people of the Virginia Company and, and the Virginia Company was having a great deal of difficulty finding people to go to North America, which is dangerous, wild, unknown, uh, difficult to get to, difficult to come back from. Um, and so Virginia Company was looking for settlers. The, um, the Dutch, the English exiles in the Netherlands were looking for a new home. Uh, the two came together. Uh, and uh, in 1620, um, the group left, uh, departed Plymouth, Leiden to Plymouth, Plymouth to what they thought was going to be an area in the mid, in the mid what are now the mid-Atlantic states. They were intended to, to land probably in what is today New Jersey or part of New York. Uh, but they got blown off course and they ended up on, on Cape Cod, uh, sighting land on November 18th which is um, not a great time to be there and not being able to actually land and settle, uh, uh, begin settling a permanent col colony until um, December. So uh, the, it was a harrowing voyage uh, of the 102 people on board, five were, five were lost, although there were two births. Uh, during the first six months after landing, uh, fully half the colony had died from disease, starvation, um, uh, adverse weather conditions, um, but they somehow established uh, themselves. Uh, and uh, part of it was um, their covenant to stay together, the, uh, to support each other in all things. And part of it was um, their faith in the future. Uh, they in contrast to some other reform traditions, which had by the time the pilgrims were launched, had established um, strong belief systems, the Lutherans and the Calvinists, um, for example, um, the uh, Puritans were more searching, less doctrinaire about um, uh, systems of belief and, and how systems of belief um, enact, become embedded in, in a um, a structure of a church. Um, and I'm going to read you a little passage from uh, John Robinson, who was uh, the minister of the congregation in Leiden, who didn't make the voyage, uh, but uh, at, at its departure preached uh, a sermon that is uh, often widely quoted. Robinson bemoaned the state and condition of the Reformed churches who had come to a period in religion and would go no further. For example, the Lutherans, they could not be drawn to go beyond what Luther saw. For whatever part of God's will he had further imparted and revealed to Calvin, uh, they will rather die than embrace it. And so also, you see the Calvinists, they stick where he left them. The misery much to be lamented, for though they were precious shining lights in their times, yea, God hath not revealed his whole will to them. He exhorted his own congregation to take heed what we receive for truth and well to examine and compare and weigh it with other scriptures of truth before we receive it. Uh, Robinson in summary, and this is the most quoted part of it, was very confident that the Lord hath more truth and light yet to break forth out of his holy word. That's an idea that sticks, that stays with us. It's an idea that's uh, embedded uh, in at First Church today. I don't know, you know this book, Hymns of Truth and Light. If you read the title page of, of this, you'll see that the Hymns of Truth and, and Light uh, is, takes as its an inspiration that quote I just read you from John Robinson. So uh, with that as an introduction, I, uh, we're going to uh, go into breakout groups to look at two questions. Um, and hopefully they're uh, 
available. Hillary, I'm going to turn it back yep. to you. Yep, I got it. I got it. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. It's it's so interesting to hear stuff that you didn't know about this story that you thought you knew this story, but there's other stuff. Um, one of the things I just want to uh, read is that the the our pilgrims believe that the integrity of their congregation, their congregation, was vital to be arrived at by prayer, study, and discussion with fellow congregants. Well, that's what we do, right? So. <laughs> All right, so we're going to try to put you in groups. Um, this is going to be interesting. And we have two questions for you to talk about. The first one is, in separating themselves from the Church of England and establishing themselves as independent, an independent community, separatists, right? The pilgrims very carefully defined the boundaries of their faith community. As a faith community grows and moves through time, however, it often faces the challenge of either adapting to new views or shrinking into its core beliefs. How does a religious community retain its spiritual identity while continuing to evolve? Looks like Hillary's frozen. Um, while she's frozen, uh, she uh, left off as while continuing while continuing to evolve and attract new adherents. How might you see this question as it could relate to First Church in Cambridge? And then the second question she had for us was, what qualities did the pilgrims need in order to succeed as a community, especially on their journey and in the early years? I hope she's okay. Yeah. All right. Lexi, are you doing this? Hi, Hillary. Yeah, I just shared my screen in case people were visual learners. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, I um I was trying to do breakout rooms and it the machine dumped me out. Okay, okay. let's see how many people in each room. No, it's doing it again. Don't do that. Let's see, we got five. Sorry, everybody. All right. Okay, ready? Here we go. Woo. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm muttering to myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll see, I'll see. All right, there's Dave. I want to see everybody. Okay, okay. 13. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Oh, look at them all. <laughs> uh, all right. Good. I think I think only Dan is missing and he's gone off to do priestly things, no doubt. Um one of the things I just wanted to mention before we discuss is um, I'm so struck by the description of what they had to go through on the Mayflower. Mm. I mean, we're talking about, you know, five foot high ceiling. I think it was 20 foot wide and I don't know, like 80 feet long. And all these people, kids, women giving birth, people dying, cows or chickens or whatever the hell. I mean, it was awful. It was really mm -hmm. awful. And I can't help thinking that the, the two months they spent doing that must have been um, really a, a very traumatic experience. I don't know how many of these folks had ever been on any ship like this. Probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe they all had, I don't know. But I just keep visualizing that and thinking, and then they arrive here. Now, John and I just got back from Cape Cod yesterday and we walked on the Pilgrim Spring Trail where there's a cute little plaque that says here on December, whatever it was, you know, a group of us found this spring of fresh water and we were so thrilled and excited. And it's mm. like, that's their fresh water. What kind of a water do you think they had on the ship? I mean, it was a horrible thing. Yeah, anyway, all right. 
there. So, okay, so what do you think? How does a religious community retain its spiritual identity while continuing to evolve and attract new adherents? Who wants to say something? Somebody speak. Come on. That's the question that we couldn't remember. <laughs> oh, well, it was on you. Okay, so who's got, who's got some response to that? One of the questions our group, we couldn't remember the question either, but one of the questions we asked, and then since we were on Zoom, we could look it up, was what the ratio of the business people was to the yeah. religious people. Yeah. And it was yeah. sort of, it was, it was two to one in favor of the business people. Yes. So yes. this religious community was a relatively small number yes. of people. Yes, and um, I think, mm. I, just again, visualizing what it must have been like. So here were these folks, um, and then they were this tiny group that had been shuffled from pillar to post in Europe, and now this horrible trip, and here they were in nowhere land, and how this must have brought them so close together. Maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. well, they connected with the Indians there, too, in Plymouth. Yes, yes, that right. Plus. Yes. Well, so if, if you couldn't remember the question, I'm going to pose it again. You know, how does a religious community like ours, let's say, continue to evolve while still maintaining its core beliefs. How do you do that? Well, the first thing that was said in our group, and I think it was Perry who said it, was that the most important thing had to be trust, that they had to trust each other. They, had, they were totally dependent on each other. So, so that was a core situation that they had to trust. Yeah. And how does that, how does that, how could, how could you, how can you translate that or trans, translate that to us in first church now? We have a covenant. We, they had a covenant. We have a covenant. That's the key element. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the questions that's posed in this curriculum is, oh, does your church have a covenant? Is it up to date? Do you feel that it's contemporary enough? If not, maybe you should rewrite it. I mean, that's interesting, too. But is that, I mean, is that throwing the baby out with the bathwater? I mean. We still have our old covenant, even though we did rewrite it. How yeah. long ago? We rewrote it in 1988, when I was first here. And we yeah. did talk about that in our group. Um, well, say some more about that, Kate. Well, the, the, uh, the covenant that we wrote is very similar to the covenant that was written all those hundreds of years ago. So there's a, a common thread, even some of the wording I think is, is similar. Um, and I think that there comes a time, one of the ways that the, um, that the congregation keeps its faith is by renewing by renewing the covenant like we did in 1988 and maybe we need to take a look at it again how, how does uh, i'm thinking about i keep thinking about this phrase the other the other mm -hmm. so first of all um as uh, so somebody was just saying susie or somebody was saying you know there was really only a small group of these folks on the ship and the other folks were the other or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe they were the other pilgrims. <laughs> so first you had to contend with these people that didn't come on this voyage to seek, particularly seek religious freedom, although maybe that was handy for them. So there was that. But then also later on, not too later on, more um, groups of religious people came and they had their own congregations. And so our congregation there in Plymouth had to try to preserve its way of thinking. And I was talking to Dave about this when we were discussing this the other day, and I'm thinking our pilgrims that we're talking about now, they went through hell and gone to get here. These other people came, hey, there were houses, there were, yeah, yeah, you know, no problem. Here's a well, you know, hey, we didn't have to go out looking for a spring. So you guys, you have no idea. So I'm thinking there was another other thing but they were all together. How do you keep them together? How do you? Well, there are issues that come along 
that uh, everyone has to address individually as well as a community. And uh, I guess the first issue that the pilgrims in 1620 faced was security, how to deal with uh, the Native Americans and, and how to protect themselves and, and how to build their cottages and, and dig a well and all that kind of stuff. So sustaining the community was probably the top issue in the early going, uh, you know, at least for the first year, and then how to, how to feed yourself, how to grow, grow plants and, and so forth. But nowadays, it seems that we have a lot of other kind of quite different issues, but we seem to agree on some issues too. And that, I think that's part of what keeps us together. Uh, and, and the political issues, religious issues, environmental issues, there are lots of things that we agree on. And and uh, it's a and we, you know, cultural issues, music and, and and drama and, but I think what holds us together and what allows us to expand as a community is a general agreement about what these issues are and which side of the side of the uh, uh, we're, we're taking on them, yeah. as well as a, as well as a trust that the someone new isn't going to totally disrupt everything and turn it upside down and and cause a big problem. We don't want that. <laughs> At least I don't want it. I'm too old for that. <laughs> well, look a little at all the issues you've raised. I mean, it's like, is somebody going to walk in the door at First Church and say, oh my God, I, this isn't my, this is not my crowd and leave? <clears throat> or, yeah, I mean, then, so, all right, some, some of you people haven't said a word. Say something about this. How do we make people that are not us, quote, not us, others, how do we make them welcome? I think we go back to scripture and see that the commandments are love your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. And when Jesus was asked, who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. To me, that's a question of where are the boundaries? And he told a story where the Good Samaritan crossed boundaries to help someone in need. And I think that Jesus was often talking across lines. He talked to the Phoenician woman at the well, and there was a sense of openness that I think uh, we need to emulate. It's often been said that it would be more difficult for a Republican to walk in the door and feel comfortable at her church than for an atheist. So true. <laughs> that's, that's something, if it, does, if it happens, yeah. what, what would we, how would we do that? Yeah. I, I do feel that, um, yeah, and what the problem is, if, if we want to attract more people, the, we may have to accept more diversity and a little bit more rough edges and a little bit more uncomfortableness um, in our, our group. And what does that mean? And for some, you know, Perry, it's rough because that's not exactly what you just said you wanted. And um, so it's because there's a lot of diverse people out there. And I think we're, so anyway, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, but, thing. but gee, uh, on the other hand, um, you know, going back to the pilgrims, um, they were this tight group. And the whole idea was they were one body in Christ. They were one body, th them. And um, taking other people into that body might have been very challenging. But on the other hand, you know, they want to... They want to grow. So you, you can just see this conflict between just what we're talking about here at First Church. You know, we have our ways and other people don't have those ways. And, um, you know, so they're kind of suspicious. We're suspicious of them and all that. And they're suspicious of us. And that just doesn't sound right, does it? But on the other hand, here's, yes, that's right, Karen. Yeah, 36, yeah. Um, I was just saying, I'm sorry that I misread it, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's really, uh, I mean, it's a tiny group. I don't know if you saw what Karen wrote. She said there were 36 or 37. 
I said that I, I miss that I'm sorry that I misread it. The Mayflower originally had 70 business, 36 um, religious, but mm -hmm. then the Speedwell had the, all these religious people. So when right. they in Plymouth, when they abandoned the Speedwell, it ended up that the Mayflower that came to Massachusetts was actually two to one the other way, more yeah. religious than more business. religious. Yeah, yeah. Bruce, yeah. Has, Bruce has been trying to get in here. Yeah. Oh, speak. Uh, the. Um, there's an interesting tension to me, um, like when we just talked about how we can be more welcoming, that brings to my mind just this uncomfortableness with um, what feels like the history of the Puritans that they're separating. I, I don't read that story as a novice, I, I do not read that story as one of being welcoming. <laughs> I read that as a story of we're, we're done with being oppressed. Like we're going to go somewhere new, and so to me, the welcoming question feels like some recognition that we come from stock that is not about being welcoming. That's like we're done with being oppressed, and we're going to go somewhere where we get to be with people who are, who are like us, and that's our roots. Yeah. And uh, I took a look at the 1648 Cambridge platform. It said, God did not intend the, uh, the doors of the church to be open to all. That's what it says. Oh, Jack. <laughs> I'm, I'm out of here. here. <laughs> 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 oh. Lindsay, Lindsay, that was written at our church, right? Yes, yes. Well, they, they had a convention of the people from yeah. all churches came and met at the first church meeting house. Yes. Oh, we can put that Bobby. over our doors. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Both gangs are trying to say something yeah, here. Davis wants, Dave wants to well, say I just uh, would, would uh, push back uh, on that a little bit and, and recall the, the notion that um, from the John Robinson sermon that yeah. there is yet more truth in life. Yeah. Um, That's what I was thinking too. Yeah. We were, um, as you know, we all know or suspect or were taught that in the 17th century there was a lot of controversy inside the, the Puritan Commonwealth in Massachusetts. There was Anne Hutchinson and Mary Dyer and Roger Williams and uh, stories of conflict and stories of um, pushing people outside the boundary. Uh, but in all of those cases there was uh, a long attempt at reconciliation uh, first, uh, um, discussion uh, of um, being a little open to listen. I mean, some more open than others. Uh, but I, I do think that there, there were, uh, there was an orthodoxy, but it wasn't uh, 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 as fiercely protected. Uh, an orthodoxy is in some other uh, places and uh, at other times. Mm -hmm. um, but they were willing to talk, and they will, they were willing to learn, and they changed. Mm -hmm. But isn't it, fair to, yeah. isn't it fair to say that the defining trait here is that they left? They left a whole country. Yeah, they left a whole life, their whole life. And so I, yeah. I feel like those are two important things. Like, yes, there's the openness, but there's the sort of just being done with their own country. No. Yeah, they were persecuted, though. I mean, you know, they were, it wasn't just you know, they threw up their hands and we can't deal with these people. It was more if we stayed, we were going to go to jail. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So what, what qualities then did these people have to have in order to be successful under these horrible circumstances coming over here? They had to have women so that they could have more children. Huh? Yeah, and they did. <laughs> they did. Yeah, good. Yeah. A, I was saying to my group when I went to the museum in Plymouth, England a few years ago, that was the thing I came away with was that the Virginia oh. company had been primarily men. And huh. the difference with the, um, who, who would go and then go back to England. And the difference here was these are people who went to, went to live, went to stay. And so they brought their families and that was different. Yeah, I second this uh, note that Marion has about um, <clears throat> the book by Nathaniel Philbrick uh, mm -hmm. on the Mayflower. He's a, just a superb, wonderful writer, and yeah, his yeah. stuff is just delicious. Uh, and he lives yeah, on yeah. Nantucket. Yeah. Uh, Dave, and do you recommend that uh, PBS thing you were talking? Yeah, there was a PBS um, part 
a car film it was done in 2015 by Rick Burns, who's Ken Burns' brother. It's called The Pilgrim. It's available on the PBS website, and if you have Amazon Prime, it's for, you can stream it for free. Yeah, it's really, it's quite interesting, and certainly is pertinent it's to everything we're talking too. about here. Say again? It's quite beautifully filmed as well. Yes, it is. Yeah. Black Sea? And of course, you know, in uh, another time, in a, a non-COVID yeah. context, yes. you can visit <laughs> the plantation and, and see not only the reconstructed village, but also the, the Native American yeah. uh, village. And, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, people, we, um, <clears throat> we're out of time here. Um, I hope this was... Um, interesting and productive um, for you. Um, yeah. we, we hope we can manage some of this maybe technically a little better. I'm, this is like the first time I've ever done all this stuff. So next, not next week, but the following week, uh, October 4th, um, the topic is they were people of the book. God is still speaking and they were listening. <laughs> All right, so um, have a little break out now before we go to church. And um, thank you, Hillary. Thank, thank you, Hillary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.